The Melba Story. The story of Australia's most famous woman. The true story, fully authenticated, and featuring another wonderful Australian singer, Glenda Raymond. The Melba Story. On May the 8th, 1889, Melba made her Paris debut and was so successful that she was able to secure for herself a very good contract with the Paris Opera. Meanwhile, she had been corresponding with a certain Lady de Grey, an English patroness of the arts, who had been urging her to come back to London. Finally, Lady de Grey made a special trip to Paris and greeted Melba with these words. Juliet herself. A little older than Shakespeare's Juliet, I'm afraid, Lady de Grey. How could a girl of 16 sing the music of Gounod? It calls for great art. And you have it, my dear. London didn't think so last year. Your talents were recognized by the discriminating view. And as I told you in my letter, the Princess of Wales was among them. Is the Princess Alexandra very musical? Extremely so. She was deeply impressed by your singing in Rigoletto. And also by your appearance. She agrees with me that you are an ideal choice for Juliet. So I came over to fetch you. I'm sorry, Lady de Grey. I won't take no for an answer. And I won't be called Lady de Grey. I feel that I've known you for years already, my dear. And that we're going to be great friends. So will you call me Gladys? Yes, of course. And I'm Nellie, I know. I was going to use that name at the first possible opportunity. <laughs> Do you think I'm taking too much for granted? Not as far as our personal relationship is concerned. I, too, feel that we're going to be friends, Gladys. But that doesn't mean I'm going to sing in London. Why are you so determined to refuse me? For two reasons. One, because I've just signed a contract with the Paris Opera. I can arrange things with them. And two... Because London doesn't interest me. But it will, Nellie, I promise you. No, I'm sorry, but I can't. You must have been very badly hurt on your last visit. Not only then, but also when I first went to London. Do you know what happened to me? What, my dear? I was ignored by Professor Parry, patronised by Sir Arthur Sullivan, and turned out by your great teacher, Alberto Randegger. Oh, no, impossible! Randegger never makes a mistake. In that case, Brussels and Paris are wrong. Give him another chance, Nellie. Give London another chance, will you? You're so insistent, Gladys, that it hurts me to refuse you. Don't say any more now. Just think over what I've said. All right. I'll think it over. My dear, it's all arranged. What do you mean? A gala performance of Romeo and Juliet at Covent Garden on June the 15th. How interesting. Yes, indeed. I've been working so hard to make it possible, and now success. Congratulations, my dear Gladys. And the cast? One that has never been equaled anywhere. First of all, Mancinelli is conducting. Oh, I hear he is a first-class musician. Oh, yes, a genius. And for the nurse, I've engaged Mademoiselle Barmeister. A charming woman and a great little artist. For the friar, Edouard de Resque. Oh, I need say nothing about him. For Romeo, Jean de Resque. Magnificent. One of the greatest artists in the world. And for Juliet, who else but Melba? Have you asked her? Many times. And has she accepted? Well, practically. <laughs> Oh, you're hard to refuse. Then don't refuse. London treated me very badly. The Princess of Wales wants you. I was practically ignored. You'll be under my care. The performance was badly conducted. This time you'll have Mancinelli. The cast was second rate. Jeanne and Edouard de Resque. You have an answer for everything, haven't you? It's all arranged, Nelly. And your first social engagement is at my home in Bruton Street. 
where you'll meet everybody worth knowing, including the Prince and Princess of Wales. Your Royal Highness, may I present the distinguished Australian soprano, Madame Melba. I am so pleased that Lady de Grey was able to persuade you to come again to England. I asked her to do her best. I regarded Your Royal Highness's wish as my command. How charming. And what a fib. Oh, no, sir, I assure you. Oh, Edward, you are embarrassing the poor girl. May I not be presented? Redis. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, Sir, may I present Madame Melba? You may indeed. This is a great pleasure for me, my dear. Thank you. I've just been talking to the Count of... Well, never mind the name. But I can assure you it's much more pleasant to meet a charming prima donna than a stuffy diplomat. Edward. <laughs> you see, Madame Melba, that I cannot call my life my own. Really, Edward? But here at Bruton Street, Gladys permits me to uh, unbend a little. Your Royal Highness needs no encouragement from me. For shame, Gladys. You give Madame Melbourne a bad impression of me. Oh, no, sir. You don't find me too undignified? I find your Royal Highness very human. Bravo, my dear. It's what he likes to hear about all else. But I'm afraid, Edward, that you've shocked her notions of decorum. Is that true, madam? Why, sir, I... It's true that I can never be accused of being too conventional. The Queen, my mother, will tell you that, wouldn't she, Alex? Oh, you mustn't let him frighten you, my dear. <laughs> we are all just ordinary human beings. You can see that. Yes, madam. But you see, I've been brought up to regard the members of the royal family as... Uh, as something akin to deities? Yes, sir. Oh, what a charming smile she has. We must try to make it appear more often. But what of this wonderful voice I've heard so much about? When am I to hear it? Will you sing for us now, Nelly? Yes, of course, but I've never been so nervous. My dear. Because of the deities? Perhaps. Oh, this child is delightful, Edward, quite delightful. It is we who should be nervous. I wait with trepidation. <laughs> uh, Gladys, announce her. Yes, of course. My friends, we are now to have the very great pleasure of hearing our distinguished guest, Madame Melba. <laughs> this young Australian soprano has had tremendous success both in Brussels and Paris and is shortly to appear at Covent Garden in Gounod's Romeo and Juliet under the patronage of Her Royal Highness the Princess of Wales. Her Hear for yourselves, this good Madame Melba will sing Annie Laurie. Oh,
Well, Edward, isn't she all I said? All you said and more, Alex. We look forward to hearing you at Covent Garden, my dear. Have you started rehearsals yet? No, sir. I have to see Mr. Augustus Harris at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Come in. Come in, dear lady. I'm delighted to see you again. Are you sure of that, Mr. Harris? Quite, quite sure. Take this chair. It's more comfortable. And you'll be out of the draft, too. We have to be careful of that precious voice of yours, you know. Is it any more precious than it was last year? Ah, I don't blame you for your reproof, my dear. You were treated abominably. But it won't happen again. You recall my words? Which words in particular, Mr. Harris? I said it wouldn't be long before they were clamoring for Melba, above all others. Do you know, I had the impression that I said that. You, madame? Uh, only as a joke, of course. Ah, but I meant it. And I've said the same thing to Lady de Grey. They'll be hearing Melba again, I said. But next time, by gad, they'll have to pay for her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said that, Mr. Harris. Glad? Why? Because it saves me from saying it. Uh, you mean uh, you want a little more than last time? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll be able to arrange something to our mutual satisfaction. We won't quarrel over a few pounds, I hope. I'm very pleased to know that, Mr. Harris. Because, you see, things have changed a good deal since last year. Changed? How? Well, for one thing, I've learned a little more sense. <laughs> good, good. I'm glad to hear it. Now, let me see. What were we paying you last year? I don't remember, Mr. Harris. But whatever it was, I'm now asking for exactly twice as much. In a few moments, we'll return to the Melba story. The Melba story. Surely you're joking, Madame Melba. No, Mr. Harris. You're seriously asking for twice as much as you received last year? Yes, I am. And like Clive of India, I'm astonished at my own moderation. Hmm. You're determined to make London atone for last year, aren't you? I can honestly assure you, Mr. Harris, that I'm not merely actuated by motives of revenge. I really think I'm worth what I'm asking for. And I'm sure that you'll soon be paying me even more. You're very confident, Madame Nova. Only now, after I've become familiar with all the pitfalls and the difficulties of an operatic career. Are there so many difficulties? For an Anglo-Saxon, yes. Take my case, for instance. Wherever I sing in opera for the rest of my life, I shall have to use a foreign tongue, which means that I shall always be in a position of peculiar and trying isolation. Oh, but this is a British company, madame. Is it? How many British singers in it? Well... Only um... one. Melba. A colonial. Why, even the members of the chorus are foreigners. I'm surrounded by Italians, Poles, Frenchmen and Germans. I feel like... like Daniel in the lion's den. <laughs> <laughs> a very charming and accomplished Daniel, and one capable of holding her own anywhere, both as a singer and as a businesswoman. Does that mean you agree to my terms? I have no alternative. Hmm. I expected you to put up more of a fight. I know when I'm beaten, Madame Melba. And besides, I expect to show a profit on you, even on the terms you've stipulated. The important thing is to keep you happy. I couldn't imagine anyone being happier than I am now. To be singing for my own people, on my own terms, and with the greatest artist of our time, Jean Doresque. So you changed your mind about London after all, Nelly? Yes, Jean. 
And do you know what influenced me most of all? No. What? The fact that I'd be singing opposite the great Jean de Resque. You mean that? Don't you remember asking me to go to London? Yes, but when I arrived, you had already gone back to Brussels. I was terribly disappointed. I won't go back this time, Jean. This time, my dear, you're going to be a wonderful success. <laughs> that remains to be proved. Do you really doubt yourself? I failed last year. Oh, that was not your fault. Many things were against you. But this time it will be very different. You must forget last year. This is 1889. And on June the 15th, you are making your real debut. Not as Lucia de Lamamour, but as Juliet. your hand. Oh, Jean. You were superb tonight. There is no other word. Who could fail to sing well with you? Oh, it is good of you to share your glory, but I will not rob you, my dear. The night is yours, oh. as many more nights will be yours. I'm so happy I could cry. Here they come, the flood of adorers. Shall I open the door, Nelly? I suppose so. 
Mayor Milburn. Who got here? I'm the evening person. I brought this glass. Good evening. Good evening. What a good time. Good evening, John. Why, it's Alberto Rande. Come in, my friend. We can give you just two minutes. That will do nicely. Nelly, may I present London's boy deal of a singing teacher? The famous Alberto Randegger. I'm so charmed to meet you, Madame Melba. This is a very great honor. You really think so, Mr. Randegger? Why? Because you're the best singer in England, perhaps in all Europe. You liked her as Juliet Alberto. I was enchanted. Never before have I heard such a voice. You hear that, Nelly? I hear, Jean. Perhaps you will be more impressed when I tell you that Alberto is recognized as the finest judge of singing in London. And I have never been wrong, never. Really, Mr. Randiger? Then if you had heard my voice when I first came to London, you would immediately have recognized its possibilities? But of course. And if I'd come to you for an opinion, or applied to be taken on as one of your pupils... Ah, if only you had. If only I had been given the chance that came to Marchese. Well... It's too late now, but I understand, my dear lady, that we are to be associated very soon. Indeed. The gala performance in honor of the Shah of Persia. Surely you know about that? Oh, yes, I believe it was mentioned to me. Uh, but I didn't know you were appearing, Mr. Andiga. You didn't? <laughs> Alberto is conducting, Nelly. Oh, sorry, I hadn't noticed that. Of course, the conductor is of little importance compared with the great prima donna... But I had hoped you would be pleased at our association, madame. Indeed, I am. But it won't be for the first time, you know, Mr. Randiger. Not the first time? We performed together three years ago. What? Alberto, you never told me this. I understood you had never met Madame Melba before. Never have I, to my knowledge. Mr. Randiger, let me tell you a story. Three years ago, a very frightened girl came to see you. She was from far off Australia. And she had a letter of introduction. She wanted you to hear her sing and then tell her if it would be worthwhile continuing her studies. What was this girl's name? She was a Mrs. Armstrong. Armstrong. I do not remember the name, but I'm sure I gave her every courtesy. Oh, yes, you let her sing for you. And you said her voice was charming. Ah, you see? And then she asked you to enroll her as one of your pupils. And what did I say? that you couldn't find room for her. Oh, yes, it often happens. So many charming voices, but few great ones. Now, if you had come to me like that, madame... But I did, Mr. Randiger. I was that girl. And you turned me away. triumphant moment for Melba, when, after her first great London success, she faces the man who had rejected her and reminds him that now he must eat his words. But this is just the beginning of a wonderful career. We will be with her on another stage of her journey in the next chapter of The Melba Story. The Melba Story was written by John Ormiston Reed and produced by Dorothy Crawford. The Australian Symphony Orchestra was conducted by Hector Crawford. The role of Melba was spoken by Patricia Kennedy and sung by the Australian coloratura soprano, Glenda Raymond.